welcome to this session on refereeing sevens. Um, we do have a couple of very, very special guests with us tonight. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, as part of that, I'd like to say uh, hello and welcome to our guests. <laughs> I'd like you to uh, welcome Tom Vondell and, of course, uh, as you saw there, Mr. Hair Bear Bunch, Richard Horton. What we're going to do is look at things from a different perspective tonight. Um, we're going to go through some of the things that uh, World Rugby referees on the Seventh Circuit look at. We're going to talk about some of the things that come up for them as well. Um, and then we're going to, at different intervals along the way, we're going to look at the, um, the, the, the things from a refereeing perspective with Rich, and we're going to look at things from a player's perspective with Tom. At the beginning, Rich, can we have a, just a, a quick chat about these, uh, these things? Um, because they, these, all diff these are all different between sevens and fifteens, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in, in the olden days, you know, positioning for the sevens was very much Basically, if you get anywhere close, then you're happy to make a decision. Whereas now, I think the fitness levels and everything else that come on uh, means that you have to be close to the breakdown. There's more of a competition for you to actually referee. Um, and that's also gone from blowing the whistle immediately to giving each breakdown a little bit more time to see exactly what's happening and then try and penalise the first offence or be able to play on. Now, that's interesting because we often talked about positioning. Over the years, we, we've moved from that defensive line position, which we used to take within sevens, to a much more 15s position, which is that smiley face mm -hmm. uh, around the breakdown. So because, and I think that's because the breakdown has become more competitive. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, and you're looking at, over the last few years, especially what the World Series have tried to, to facilitate, and the idea that if you have more people in the breakdown, there is more space on the pitch. More space on the pitch means that actually there's more tries, the game is more entertaining, but also more people in the breakdown means actually there's competition there. By competition being there, that means that both teams have to actually fight to keep the ball legally as much as possible. <laughs> now, you mentioned time. That's not something we've discussed before. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? 
Um, so looking at basically any breakdown, you, there's quite a, quite a few penalties you can give straight away, like a, like a double roll, um, the tackler holding uh, the uh, first person uh, holding on, not releasing the ball, or not release the tackle player not being released. Those penalties can be given quite quickly. But there's other penalties where you can actually see what actually happens, who wins the contact, what the effect is before you decide, okay, yep, I need to give that one. Or, no, that's, the ball has come out and we're all happy to play on. So it's just giving so, that breakdown a little bit more time. This is a little bit like giving an internal advantage, would you say? To, to a certain extent. It's, exa- it's almost going down the route of 15s, as in you're looking at a breakdown, letting everything just happen in front of you. But uh, at the same point, knowing if, if you want to, this is the first offence and I can penalise it at any point when I'm, I think the ball has been affected more than it should be. OK, um, that's really interesting because it's not something that we as a group have talked about before, is that just giving a bit more time. We've always talked about uh, making that quick decision mm-hmm. because often the, the, the penalty is the advantage. And I'm sure we're going to see some of those in the, in the videos in a little while. I, I've put whistle in there because um, there, if, when, when you see the videos, you'll see the, and hear the commentators talking about the whistle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it is a quick whistle in sevens because as i've just uh, alluded to the, the often the penalty is the advantage for the non-offending side mm-hmm. um but then we've got that double whistle very very quickly after what does that signify for you and for the players it's it's usually it's going to end up being a card if you listen to the most of the commentators they read the game very well they're very well briefed on what's exactly going to happen and what they expect from the referee so if you hear a double whistle most likely the referee's going to stop the game, but he's going to stop the game to actually put someone in the bin, which gives the attacking team even more an advantage mm-hmm. um, than just the penalty. Um, so that's that's the, the process of, I'm going to have to slop, stop you from playing quickly, but you're going to have, now have the next two minutes with against six men because he's going to the bin. No, I think that's really useful. Um, and it, it's one of those things that um, if you're going to move from 15s into 7s over the summer... It's, it's one of those things you've got to get into the habit of doing quite quickly, isn't it? It is. It's the whole thing of, especially with sevens, it's very black and white what you're giving yellow cards for, what you're giving red cards for. Yes, that you've got the high tackles and things like that, or, you know, that aspect of it, which is a bit more um, debatable about if you want to give the yellow, if you want to give the red. But the rest of it is very much, OK, you've thrown the ball away, you're going to the bin. OK, you've slowed them down, you're going to the bin you know, it's very, very black and white. And that's, I think, what is uh, appreciated by the players. The main reason that it's, it's seen, it's dealt with. And every time, hopefully, you get the same result. So, Tom, from a playing perspective on that, um, now, we, we all know, and we're going to talk about this at length uh, tonight, that the, the penalty is very often the, uh, the advantage in sevens. Mm. Uh, rather than playing advantage. Uh, and I think both referees and players would agree that's the case. If, if you're about to take the quick one um, from, a, from a penalty, do you listen out for that double blast just in case there's a stoppage? And do you know that there's going to be a card coming? Yeah, definitely. Especially, especially now. I mean, I think when me and Rich were playing sevens, obviously the cards weren't, weren't given as much as they are. There wasn't that much of an advantage. I think now when you, the, the player is, is ready for that, that double whistle, they are aware of it and then they know, right, a bloke's going to go to the bin. You've got time to catch your breath as well. You've got time to get your set piece because there is a lot of set pieces around that, 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 that penalty sort of area. Um, so it just gives the players that chance to sort of compose themselves a little bit and get ready for what's going to be a planned set move. Um, whereas if it's just a single whistle, it's going to be a tap and you're just going to keep playing and try and take that advantage straight away. Okay, so from a playing perspective, what would you prefer? Would you prefer, let's say you've got an overlap, a three on two, a four on two. Uh, what would you prefer, that one, one whistle and a, let's go and let's score the try? Or actually, would you prefer to, um, to hear that double blast afterwards so that you can wait for the guy to go off? And I know they're going to restructure their defence, but they are a man down. What, what's preferable as a player? I think, obviously, it depends on the time of the game, how, t- how tired I am as a, <laughs> on the pitch. But I think to be, able to, to be able to go straight away, for me, I've always preferred that because the defence is a little bit less organised. Um, there is that 
potential there's going to be the overlap, especially on the outside. So I've always preferred to go. I was never a big fan of the, the set piece penalties. Um, and defence these days, they are they are, they are so good. I mean, defence has stepped up a lot. Um, so giving the team a chance to organise, yes, they might be a man down, but it, you know that, that momentum's gone a little bit. So I was always a, a, a fan of like, right, penalty, let's go, let's go again, let's get it. But sometimes you can get squeezed another penalty out if the, if the team hasn't retreated the, you know, the, the metres they're meant to. So there's pros and cons to it all. Um, again, the time that's left in the game is, is a big factor because obviously fatigue is there, especially in sevens. You, you know, you, you're playing seven-minute halves at 100 miles an hour. Um, that fatigue does set in. So sometimes actually taking that time to, to set yourself and go again, you're you onto a winner as well. So, Rich, listening to, uh, to what Tom said and obviously your own experience from, from both sides of the coin, um, do you look at that? And, and say, right, OK, this could, let, we're talking technical offences now, not foul play. Mm-hmm. This could be a potential yellow card. Do you have that awareness of what's going on on a very, very big pitch to say, I'm just going to blow and see what happens. And if nothing's going to happen quickly, because in my mind, I'm going yellow here then I'm going to do the double blast and I'm going to card somebody? Or is it just one of those things that sort of passes you by? No, no. Uh, especially refereeing on the series, it's more this is the expected outcome. If you get two, uh, two minutes without a player, then most likely the other team will score at least one try. Mm-hmm. So you're okay. looking at that as a, as a tactical advantage. If you score one try in the first 30 seconds, you've got another minute and a half to score another try. So your advantage is actually the man off. Like whilst Tom was speaking, I was just thinking from my, my point of view, especially if I had Tom's speed, it'd be slightly different, would be... We've every seen time, that in your show reel, mate. Well, exactly. Every time I decide to have a scrum. There's three people in the scrum. The scrum have to stand there. It's, four, it's you know, three in the backs versus two. There's always an overlap. There's always mm. space to attack. And so, so for referees going into this summer's sevens, um, you'd say if, if we've hit that threshold whatever that may well be. And we'll, we'll probably talk about that later on in, in, the, in the chat once we've seen the videos. Once we've hit that threshold for yellow card, potentially, assuming it's technical and not foul play, um, you'd rather, even as a referee, you'd rather do that because it aids the team. Exactly. And you're looking at the, giving, giving the attacking team who have been legal an advantage. And the advantage is better to play against six men than it is against seven and let you have one try. Lovely. Now, um, one of the um, one of the things that's different in in sevens, and I know at your level there's a great big bloody screen that that counts down. Um, we're talking timings for kicks, aren't we? Can you just remind everybody who's who's with us tonight just um, what's expected in terms of timings for different kicks? Right. So, for me and, and the people who referee where I do, um, so you've got thirty seconds from the moment you score a try or the try is awarded to, for your conversion to actually strike the ball for the conversion. From the moment you strike the ball, you've got 30 seconds to kick off. Lovely. So, and what, what about penalties? So penalties is undue delay. So if you're taking a tap for the corner or you're kicking for, for touch, then as long as your kicker's there, you should do it as soon as possible. And then if you're taking one of the complex moves that most sevens teams decide they're going to put together, which I always hated, then, you know, you give them a little bit more time, but it's the whole thing of you're just trying to hurry them up. If you listen to any of the 15s referees, you can hear them at scrum time going, yep, let's go, let's go, let's speed it up, let's get the ball in. That's almost the same for on the fifth, uh, seven side pitch. You just wanted to get them to play, to get it all moving again. Lovely. Now, um, there's one thing, it, of course, we, we normally see, certainly at the, in finals or at the top level, we see five guys on the pitch uh, in terms of match officials. Two of those are assistant referees. Now, one of the, the, the interesting things that I found um, ARing in, in the series was that um, whilst we teach people, even at society level, that penalty only is just a feed in off the radio, um, in, in seven, this is a flag in all the time. Yeah, I think it's more... It's not necessarily just for you. And this is like, I, I remember I, when I referee um, 15s, I almost sometimes put this in, onto the ARs. It's so that everyone knows there's a penalty. 
It's so everyone else can read the game rather than it just being, okay, there's a penalty. Yeah, I'm going to put my advantage out. No, the flag's out there. The, the AR's put his flag out before I've even signaled anyone. It's been signaled that there has been either foul play or something's happened. Therefore, it can be passed on to me. And it's like, okay, it's almost selling, selling a decision before it's actually been seen. And that's nothing to do with the fact that you missed that high shot at Dings a couple of years ago, mate, when I was on the line with you. Of course yeah. not. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> now, um, the, the thing that we do have in sevens that we don't have in fifteens is the in-goal judges. Mm. Now, in-goal judges, everybody thinks it's a lazy position. Actually, it's not. It's a really intense position because you've got to track across that, that whole width of the pitch, wherever the ball is. Um, and one of the things that we always say is that w if the referee is coming from outside to inside, you're doing the opposite. And if the referee, and trust me, Richard does this a lot, changes his position and goes inside to outside, you've got a lot of work to do in goal so that you can see the opposite angle. Um, now, uh, there have been times, Rich, where um, there has been foul play just, you know, five metres from, from the goal line. What's the, 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 the world rugby um, guidelines and the sevens guidelines for that in-goal judge coming in for foul play? So the in-goal judge can only go it come in for anything that's in goal. In goal. So if it's five metres out, if it's two minutes out, he can't come in for foul play or something he's seen. He can, if I ask him, you know, has the ball been lost forward? He, go, he can go, this try was not scored. Or he can give me other information, but technically he shouldn't tell me, no, he's knocked it on before the line, although he can infer that. <laughs> uh, so one of the things for, for us when we, we're doing community rugby is that uh, I, I think the key is there. If you're in goal, you are judging in goal only. So if there is foul play, you can put your flag in at, as long as it happens in goal. So the knees to the to the player or, or things like that. Now, um, one of the things that I, that's not always clear, Rich, is this, um, what happens if the ball goes dead over the dead ball line or touching goal? What's, what's the current thinking for the in-goal judge to then put his flag up if that happens? Because I've, I've seen different things where flag goes up and then the point. I've seen things where people just point and keep their flags down or just the flag up. What's the current thinking at the moment? For me, it's still just flag up and then we can go from there. If, Lovely. If it's clear and obvious and I've, uh, you know, he basically, it's been close, but it's in goal. Okay, right. I can have a conversation. Other than that, everyone should realise what it is. It's just it has touched the line or the foot is out. Then we can go and move on from there. That, that's lovely. I, mean, I think that's cleared up a, a, a huge amount. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at, um, at some different videos. These are the ones that were produced by World Rugby in 2020 for the, uh, the international uh, referees on, on the seven circuit. Um, you, you're going to see different clips. Uh, you'll see each one twice, uh, once with the sound and once without, so that um, we can explain things. Uh, Tom and Richard, Although uh, you'll see the video, please just jump in if the sound's off. We can always pause it uh, for you, no problem at all. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight is the tackle. Um, there's the law for you, just in case you need to know what it is. Um, and it goes through the, the various obligations of, of everybody else. So first of all, we're going to look at the obligations of the tackler. And you're going to see a few different clips coming up now. now. Tackle in the corner, attempt by Bistrova. And she does manage to wrap her up, but five metres short of the Russian try line. And then the Russians give away the penalty. Quick tap and go. So I think you can see this is quite clear here that actually the Russian um, supporting player traps her own tackler in there, um, which means that uh, the England seven can't get her out. It's a clear penalty. Field keeps running, finally dragged down. Good tackle made on him by Cuthbert. And Cuthbert didn't roll away. It's penalty.
Again, a very, very clear decision. The tackler just never tries to move out the way. The red player from Canada is trying to get over, um, but the other player just doesn't move. Tatsumi trying to wind her way through. It's the call. Last play of this first half. I think one of the things you'll see here is just how quick the um, the other attacking players are getting to that breakdown. The, the onus is on the uh, is on the tackler to get out of the way, and it's much quicker than it is in fifteens. Uh, so, so guys, um, looking at the tackle, uh, a few different examples there. Uh, Rich, from your point of view, is it always that quick? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you're looking at what the uh, the offence is. So the player on the wrong side slowing down the uh, the player coming in to make the clearance and getting the ball away. So it's nice and easy, nice quick decision and get the ball moving again. Tom, as, as a player, uh, let, let's first of all say you're an attacking player at this point. Um, clearly, you want that advantage. Um, first, of all, first of all, are you, are you really trying to, um, to get the ball or are you trying to just make sure the referee sees the guy on the, on the wrong side? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you don't need to answer that. From you, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I mean you're going to play up. You're going to play up to the referee. You see it in the 15th, but especially in the sevens, especially when some of them tackles are happening so close to the line as well. You're going to milk it for its worth because you want to play in the bin. You want that advantage. But at the same time, when you when the when you when you that you got that much momentum as a, as an attacking team, you do you probably do want that ball. You want to get it out wide. You want to go. But if someone is clearly lying in the way. That the person who's going for that ball in the scarf is going to milk it for its worth and tell them and let the referee know that oh sir I can't get the ball I can't get the ball so yeah definitely you're gonna you're gonna make a you're gonna make a scene about that one. Now if you were the defense put put a different hat on you know that tackler so you've tackled and like that their supporting player is upon you. It's you know twelve minutes into a fourteen minute game. Should we should we be looking from your point of view? Should we be looking at your fatigue level, the fact that you're trying, or are again, are you milking it a little bit? The thing is, though, as a as a defender, um, you you can't say, oh, as a referee, you can't say, oh, you know, it's a bit late in the game, he's a little bit tired. It's still a penalty. It's still killing the game. It's still slowing it down. It doesn't matter if it's minute one or minute, you know, minute fourteen. You, as a defender. If you can't get out of the way, then you know it's tough luck. Really, it's just you're going to get pinged, and and that's the that's the beauty of the, of the game of sevens. There is so many small margins in it that that's why it makes it so exciting. But players can you teams can lose a player, and unfortunately, it's just the way the game is at the moment. And you have to and you just have to work harder. <laughs> well, Rich, I think we can make a um, a referee out of him after, after that comment. <laughs> and that's going on record. It's going all over social media. <laughs> Tom Fondell said that they've got to make a, a, a bigger effort. Um, think, so, if you look at if you look at all those all those clips, the same thing happened in all of them, which was the first map player from the defensive team came to compete, and by that person competing, makes it more obvious that the, the, clip, the person coming to clear the ball, get the ball out, can't do it. Yeah. If the player was in the way, and the ball's available, mm. it'd be slightly different. If the player falls on him, then you're like, okay, got, might have to penalise it. Whereas those are very clear and obvious that the person coming in to clear can't clear the player who's competing for the ball, the jackler, because of the tackler being on the wrong side. As we've seen recently in the 15s game. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is the beauty of sevens, is seven, 15s seem to follow some, some of the sevens examples. Still, it's the USA with ball in hand, the status. So if you watch here, it's um, it's a double tackle from New Zealand, and the, the, the like in 15s, the player assist just doesn't let go, and it slows down that quick ball. Exactly yeah. that, and I think you can see that that's one of the penalties you blow quite quickly because there's no advantage to the the attack. They're not going to get the ball away. Most likely, the defense is going to throw the ball away. If, you do it a little bit later. So it's much easier to give the quick decision, give them a penalty and let them get on with it while the defence has to move back. 
I think that's a real good point is giving that quick decision. Mm-hmm. If if the if the um, if the defence if the tackling team is there and it's a clear release and we we've talked about that before in 15s a few years ago the clear release and straight back on the ball they should be rewarded but if not and especially if the um, the attacking team has a player there ready to play the ball they the, are the ones that should be re- re- rewarded as well Rich. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you don't even need to, to really think about the attacking team having someone there. If there's no clear release, there's no clear release. It doesn't matter what you do. It's still a penalty. Okay. And give the penalty straight away. So let's just look at the next bit, which is, uh, which is about the tackled player. So we're still talking about the tackle uh, in a sense. The Scottish team here from one edge to the other. Tackle had to be made from Kelly on Thunder, and it was. He really the ball, ball before. On the, inside, the referee says, you know. So it's quite quick, but have a look at the, uh, the, the, the result here. So clearly, Seven thinks he hasn't been, uh, been tackled um, and gets straight back to his feet and goes again, rather than um, releasing the ball and, uh, and, and then picking it up again. Absolutely. And I think that's a pretty clear example. Um, this is going back, you know, two or three years in 15s where the player gets tackled, but then he immediately gets to his feet and runs off. Uh, sevens at that point had brought in. If at any point the tackler and the tackle player on the floor at the same time in contact, then it, that is a tackle. So at that point, the tackled player must release the ball, get to his feet and then play on if he wants to play the ball. In the so 15s game, Billy Vanapolo is really, actually really good at that. Nathan Hughes is another one. You yeah. see them get tackled. They're not quite held. Yes, the tackle's been completed. They do a clear release of the ball. They're back on their feet again. And obviously, they start their momentum. So, yeah, there's, there's really good examples in the 15s games of boys doing that. Um, and it is. It's a massive attacking weapon as well because the defence almost stops thinking the tackle's happened and then momentum starts again. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, there was a great example last year from one of the women who I think, I can't remember which team it was, against New Zealand. Exactly the same thing, got tackled, put the ball down, got back up, picked the ball up, ran 70 metres to score the try. Yeah. I think this is a real big focus area for referees because it's so rare that this is seen that every so often in a team, you'll find one player who understands this particular law, whether it be sevens or fifteens. And what they'll do is they will get tackled, they'll let go, everybody will get let go of the legs because it wasn't a real tackle to, for the tackler, and they'll pick the ball up and run. And as a referee, you've got to have that wherewithal and that super knowledge that, yes, this has happened, and therefore I can carry on, or no, it hasn't, there was no clear release. Because players with the ball have gone away after a tackle, and you pull them back and you've pulled them back for no reason because what they've done is perfectly legal. So as a referee, we have to be ready for that. It's just being keen on what's coming next. So let's have a look at the, uh, the next bit on, on, on this. Now with the Ospreys region, it's Thomas. And the wraparound, good tackle from Dan Norton. On the penalty. Holding on on the ground. England. There we go. Well, it's a great shot from Dan Norton, isn't it? On the outside line. Spots opportunity. Gets the ball. All importantly, uses that left hand to stop the offload. And Dan Bibby in so quickly, beating Luke Morgan over the ball. So what you're going to see here is a great tackle from Dan Norton. And he just leaves the, um, uh, the Welsh player on his back. Um, and that ha- uh, allows Dan Bibby to get straight over the ball. Uh, and, of course, the Welsh player is holding on. And this is the key angle here. So there you go. Tackle complete and straight off his, uh, on his feet to, uh, to steal the ball. Yeah, I think that's a, gr- that's a great example. Australian defence pops it up. Samuel off the edge. <laughs> He was held. Yeah, extra roll there from Kenya. He can't do that. He had a man over the ball. I think it was Chucky Stanard who's given them some too. Oli Etcher was. You see there? He's got to release it there. One more roll. You can't do that in the game of sevens anymore. Stanard looking uh, towards the referee, knowing that he was in the right. 
<laughs> I have a bit of an issue with this one, boys. Um, because if you look <laughs> at the actions of the... the yeah, the the second Australian player. So I think the tackle was completed by Australia five. Yeah, uh, and then it was uh, it was augmented by Australian thirteen. But the Australian th- and I can see why the referee did what they did uh, in real time. But on that replay, you can clearly see that the Australian thirteen has carried on holding his shirt and just rolled him that little bit more. What's the what's the Kenya player going to do? He's going to carry on that role. Yeah. That's so, the point. If, if he was fighting against it, which I know is isn't what you'd feel as a player to fight against someone rolling you, if he fought, then it looks even worse for the player underneath him, because then you're like you're seeing what he's doing, whereas all you're looking at is what you can see, and what you can see from one view, and this remember, it's only one chance you get to see this to either blow up or play on, is the the player has rolled a game to stop the Australian player getting a chance to steal the ball. Like you say, one chance to see it, and it does look like the Kenyan player takes an extra role. And I think that's the key. We, we, we've got to look at that breakdown area when we know that that is, especially when people, I always feel that when people are on their back, tackled players are on their back. That's when we as referees should, should lift our, our senses. We should heighten our focus directly to what's going on on the ground, never mind what's going on around. Because there's, if, if that, that player, the ball carrier, does not want to be on his back, no. therefore, they are potentially going to do something to get on their front so they can place the ball. And the, the tackler or the defending side is going to do something to try and keep them on the back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, look, if you think of like, all, the, all the problems we've had so far has been, well, the tackle, because that's what we're looking at. But the issue still comes with you can't look away from the tackle until it's actually finished, it's turned into a ruck, and then you can quickly look at the defensive lines. Up until that point, what are you looking for? Looking for people who are onside when it's not a breakdown? So that's where the concentration needs to be, is watching what's happening there before looking at anything else. Yeah. I mean, as yeah. a player as well, I think you know yeah. when you're tackled and you're on your back, you know you're in trouble especially in sevens, because it is so quick and someone is straight on you. And then, I mean, in, in training, we're always coached to, to, you know, if we're in a bad position, to do that role. I mean, the laws have, have adapted over the years and the role has been taken out of the game. But, but still, if you can get away with one role just to get yourself in a, in a correct position, or even as you tackled, you're landing on the ball and then you're doing the long place. They're, they're the things that you're taught. But you know, as a player, if you're tackled with your back, you're in trouble because that ball is going. So I think it makes the decision a lot easier for the referees. If you do see that player, right, you're on your back. There's no way you're getting that ball away. So we're going to have a look now at the arriving players into the tackle area. A, a chaos theory, if you will, the way that they like to manipulate the game. As it is, Canada trying to manipulate the game up into enemy territory, getting the ball for the uh, offside. Now, this is probably one of the most obvious um, uh, entering the ruck or the tackle from the wrong side you'll ever see, mainly because <laughs> she's entering from Abu Dhabi. Um, <laughs> it, uh, but, it, but it does highlight a point. You've got to be aware of those. So now we're going to have a look at uh, arriving players staying on the feet. Now, I, I really feel sorry for Ireland in this one because I think she went for the ball. Um, the ball was then placed, if you have a look now. Um, so here it comes. There's a tackle. She's gone for the ball. The tackle player places the ball further back. That means the Irish player is no longer on her feet mm-hmm. and she's got to let go, and she didn't. Is it hard? Now, this is something that we see quite often, even in 15s, is they've made the tackle and now look at them. They're pushing beyond that tackle and by crawling. Look at it again now. So there's the tackle up on his feet, hands to ground. There is absolutely no way, even if they, uh, the, the um, Canadians were, were coming from the right side, which of course they weren't there, there is absolutely no way that that was ever going to be, uh, be legal for them. Um, Richard, ha- you know, that, you've got one look at this, as you, as you said before. 
Um, what do you what are you really looking for there? So the player, ideally the first rowing player on their feet coming through the gate. There's you know your starting point, same as 15s, and when at that point of contact, then you're looking at having actually like almost a pushing contest between the two players. So as long as both players can stay on their feet and have a pushing contest, we've got a competition, which is what we want. If one of those players decides to go off their feet and therefore, so let's say the, um, the attacking player goes off his feet, so the defensive player is winning, then you're looking to reward the defence for the main reason they've done, they've done nothing wrong and they should win the ball. Yes, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you have me worried that you... Hmm. You've got a, a rook is defined as players on their feet with the ball on the ground pushing over. Yeah, you know, if you've got your hands on the ball, on the on the floor, um, it, it, it's simple. The thing is, this is not often seen in fifteens because then by the time you've got your hands on the floor and you're trying to crawl, three people have uh, have come in and and defended. Whereas in sevens, I think this is more more acute because. You've got mate one, maybe two people into that rook as a defence, so it, it's it's much more uh, highlighted to uh, to a referee. I, I think, especially with sevens, you've got every single year, each team will look at how to get their one two percent improvements. So they'll bring something to the table every year. So the bring bring a crawling through the ruck, and very quickly the referees will say, "Well, you can't do that." <laughs> It might be one referee who picks it up and goes, well, they can't do that, so I'm going to penalise it. And then it will be within the next couple, you know, day or by the next tournament the following week, all the referees will well, we're not having any of that. So any team that does it, it's like, well, you, had, you were lucky one week, but now everyone knows that if that happens, what they would expect, because it, of course, has been brought up to the coaching staff, to the players. So if they do it, you're like, well, it's not like we haven't told you. Mm. Exactly. And the, the interesting thing is, don't forget, this, th these videos that we're seeing now, they're nothing new in, in terms of the laws of the game. Absolutely. And I think this is, this is the other aspect of it, is these focus areas are sent to the players, and the management, and the coaching staff, for the main reason that this is how we will referee. If we do not referee like this, therefore, you can actually, you know, you can have your two cents with us, definitely. But if this is our focus area and we referee what we've shown you what that we will, then you've got little argument if you do things on the video that, you know, we've told you we're going to referee. So let's carry on with, uh, with looking at some of the, uh, the things on the video now. So we're still talking about the tackle area in this point of view oh, and what uh, arriving players must do. See much happening down that left hand line. Comes back towards his teammates, and then they are pinged for going off their feet at the breakdown. Sealing off, I think the call was Zach Text. It was fairly obvious there, Rich. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can see that there's no competition, no chance of a competition there. And no, <laughs> and I know they, I know Russia backed off there, but they d had no choice really, did they? And this is one of the discussions that Mike Friday brought up is what came first, the chicken or the egg? And it's, do I back off because I can't actually have the competition or does the competition not come in because there's no chance of it winning it? And this is, this is almost, you know, when Mike was speaking to us, the referees about it, he was saying, if I'm coaching a player and I see that it's ceiling and we've got no chance of winning the ball, then I might as well keep my players out and have seven people up. If that That's a player, good point. If that player is in a position where we can counteract and we can have a competition, if I send a player in, then I know I'm actually either going to affect the ruck to slow the ball down, or we could turn it over. But it's it's one or the other. It's not I can't send someone into a contest of what we've got no chance of winning because it's been already been sealed off. So with that in mind, that is something that you know we was brought to our attention. We thought about it and went, well, if the if the attacking player is slightly higher on their feet and we can have a competition. That goes back to the whole thing of creating more space, therefore more tries, and everyone's happy. I, I like that, that uh, and what Mike's brought to, to your attention is, if they do that, clearly defences are just going to back off. But because they back off, it doesn't mean, as it does in 15s potentially, that you should ignore it. And that's the big thing, is the difference between 7s and 15s. In 7s, there's lots of th things that, 
you wouldn't, well, you wouldn't referee in 15s because you'd say they're not material, but sevens, they have a massive effect. And because they have a massive effect, it changes the emphasis on the game. Let's have a look at this next one then. Drag to the ground and the ankle the door, driving straight in. <laughs> I think that's just, just sealed your point, really, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. There's a, an absolutely classic example. There's a jackaler there. They cleared out. Stop the jackal, stop the contest, without a doubt a penalty. That's support from Sage. I can't play on from that, but you're sealing off. Yeah. I can't play for So let's just have a look at that one again. So if you if you notice the uh, South African player just comes in almost crawling to get over the ball. Yeah, and, and this is the thing, I think that's one of the other differences between fifteens and sevens is if you take the, the out of control, out of it, you'd probably play on in 15, 15 with most of those. Yeah. Whereas with sevens, it's like, well, no, there's, you've got to clear the person. You can't just go underneath them and dive off your feet. You want yeah. the competition to be there and a chance of competition. I mean, the point is, like, in sevens, I mean, we talked earlier, I'm just going off subject a little bit, but it's so good for youngsters to play, the, to play sevens because... The actual technical ability is under the microscope. It is literally a one-off contest. It's a one-on-one, -on -one and it's, it's happens so so quickly. I mean, like like Richard said, in 15s, you you're probably getting away with that. You are in sevens yeah. because the fatigue is coming in. You're going to get their mistakes. You get boys flopping over the ball, sealing it off, and that's why it's so good for youngsters to actually take part in the game and actually get on the world stage, get on the world series, um, because you have to be so proficient at all the skills. So we're going to have a look now at the mall. Now, it, it's not a great thing in sevens, but it's, it's a really good defence mechanism, as you'll see. Um, you see it sometimes in 15s, but not um, as, as well as here. A moment. Here's up on the summer again. That's a mall. Mall from the referee. They need to get this ball back quickly. They can't sell more. So it's a mall. Again, two players the turnover. Second and white screen. Very lucky, South it is very, very simple. We often in 15s talk about, well, let it breathe, let it breathe, let it breathe. I think that's breathed far enough, certainly in the sevens game, to say, yes, that's that's a mall. It's gone down, turn over ball. Uh, I think you're looking at it and trying to have an early call. And this is one of, one of the things with sevens is very much uh, now teams will quite happily, right, the, the player's being held up, no one's going in. So they know exactly what's going to happen is as soon as that player goes in, it's going to literally go to floor and it's going to be a turnover. So by not letting it and literally waiting to see what, what's going to happen, they're trying to see if he can somehow get a knee to floor, referee calls tackle, and they can get a chance to get the ball back. The issue with that is, of course, the referee needs to be very hot that any engagement via the defence needs to be called as, as a mall and then play more rules. When we're doing sevens, are we taking that that breath out are we are we calling them all early yeah in this we're definitely calling them all early as soon as, as soon as that second player comes in from the uh the attack we're calling more for the main reason that that's when a more has been formed therefore it's more what more laws and who brings it down so tom from a um, from a player's point of view let, let's say you're an attacking player what are you looking to achieve there you're trying to get that, you're just trying to keep, what's it, the, the, choke, the choke tackle, you're trying to keep that player off the ground, especially if you're, you know you're on the back foot, you know you're sort of probably in your 22, close to your try line, you, you know that if this, if they recycle that ball nine times out of ten, that team's going to score, especially in that position, so you're trying to slow it up, keep that player off the ground and try and sort of get that knee to the floor. So now look at it from the, you're not the ball carry, you're the next arriving attacking player. What's your priority? Um, what are you thinking as you come in? I mean, Richard touched on it. I think you've got to stand off as much as you can before you realise your teammate's, you know, done. He's, he's not going anywhere. So you have to sort of assess it a little bit. Yes, it's tough in the heat of the battle, but you have to give him time because you know if he's in a difficult position, even if you join it, you're probably not going to make too much of a difference. You're trying to hope that your teammate's going to get that knee to the floor and then that tackle can be, you know, the tackle is called and then you can just play on. So it's about biding your time as much as you can before it's too late, really, and just hoping your teammates are going to get that knee down. So this is why in sevens we, we often see a ball carrier with potentially two tacklers around them uh, and their support players waiting a metre or two away. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
definitely. Because you and don't want to... And, and they're waiting for them to hit the floor. Yeah, because then they're, they then they're in. they can then drive yeah, over. Exactly, exactly. Because you know, pretty much, if it goes into a mall, it's a turnover. You know, you've lost that ball, especially if you're in an attacking position. To lose the ball there is, is as good as giving away a penalty. It's just, it's an absolute nightmare. So you want to hold off, give your teammate as much time as possible, and then, and then go in for it and see if we win the ball back. So this is the sort of opposite to what you were talking about there. This is when the player gets a knee to, a gr to the ground. Footstep. And looking at the right arm available. Couldn't get the pass away. They're going to hold him up. Tackle, need to grind. Release. <laughs> I think he was hoping there was a need to grind there. <laughs> Three on one, I'm not sure that really happened, but maybe it was a bit of referee self-preservation. Uh, no, looking at where his hips are, I'll give him that. Need to floor? Oh, I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, and that, you know, the referee is there. He, he's got the best view without a shadow of a doubt. We, we're going to talk now about... Uh, what happens when the uh, when, when the player is uh, is off their feet and bringing them down safely? Because this happens a lot, I think, in uh, in sevens, and this is a tactic that was employed a couple of years ago, Rich, um, by England, isn't it? Yeah. In fact, I, I seem to remember England did this by carrying somebody into touch as well. It did, and it, it from that point, I think we had a massive debate about it and, and yes. the legalities of it. And I think this is why it's been brought to everyone's attention, not just um, the referees. If we're talking about the legality of that, I think that the legality aspect of it comes with as soon as you lift his legs off the floor, so he has no chance of safely coming to ground on his own accord, then. It's, mass, it's more of an issue. It's more a safety issue than anything else. I agree. With lifting a player off the is floor... The, is that the only issue there? It's sorry, cause I, I'm actually... This is new to me. So I thought that's a great tactic. <laughs> <laughs> you would, you would tell me. Like, that's awesome. When we were but, playing, absolutely no it, problem. So it would have been fine. Is but, it a safety uh, thing, is it? It's a safety I, thing, but it's also yeah. legally, when a player is off the floor, you cannot pick, drive, or move them. So the player, as a tackle, is still in a vulnerable position, so you're looking at a safety issue, and therefore you cannot pick him up and carry him over the, the sideline, which I think England weren't the only people to use this. I think uh, New Zealand have used it before. I'm trying to think if Samoa have used it. Um, it has been used previously. It quickly outlawed, though, wasn't it? It yeah. only lasted maybe two tournaments on the series, yeah. and mm. then it was everybody stopped. No, no, and this, I think this is the whole thing of, you know, we had it brought to our attention just quite quickly, put him down. If you haven't put him down within a couple of seconds, then now it's a penalty. So, Especially when the referee tells you to put him down. Exactly, and that's, that's the aspect of how we wanted to go into manage this, is put him down, because if you don't, then you know where it's going. So uh, uh, I think this is the replay of that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it is funny. It is funny. It's like, it's, a, it's so deliberate. And England did do this as a deliberate action. To, and I think this is not the best clip. There is one where they do lift him and walk him into touch, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think that, that, would be, that would be just before yeah. we'd actually had the conversation and gone, right, you cannot do this. So we're going to have a look now at the scrum. Now, the scrum in sevens is very, very different, as I think everybody will agree. It literally is ball in, ball out for the most part. But there are some issues. No different to 15s. An early push is going to get you a, uh, a free kick. There's no, I don't think anybody's got any issue there. The problem is we've got people who um, who are not, not out and out um, scrummagers who are playing in the scrum. So just be aware of the normal scrum laws. And unlikely, strange as it may well be, um, you don't always get a straight push on the three-man scrum. I think the, the, the thing for referees there is not just the, uh, the, 
the the penalty for the uh, the, the <laughs> well the, the wheeling as you can see already by eleven uh, Spain it's the quick penalty and then the quick take as well because it gets everybody off the guard and we all we always talk about that um, that quick penalty being the advantage. <laughs> Um, Richard, what do you feel about ball in, ball out in sevens? You know, ball in, ball out is, you know, what you actually want. You want the game to continue. But the issue comes with every start of, start of play or restart of play needs to be legal. And it needs to be a competition, a fair competition. So if you look at what New Zealand were doing, they were basically trying to disrupt the Fijian scrum. Therefore, it's not a fair contest. Mm. Right. We need to reward Fiji for not doing anything wrong. So at, the, at that point, if we, if we widen our point of view, Fiji are in their 22. Fiji have the put in to the scrum. New Zealand are at fault by driving upwards. Fiji have gone back 10, 12 metres before they get the ball out of the back of the scrum and then have to clear their lines. Clearly, that's a tactic from New Zealand to put pressure on Fiji. Whereas because it was done illegally, the reward for Fiji should have been the penalty so they can clear their lines and have the put in if they wish to at the line out. But let's be honest, Fiji are not going to kick the touch. They're going to tap and go and score. From of course 90 they are. Meters. <laughs> yeah. So, so the advantage for Fiji <laughs> is, is a 90 metre try. Yeah, basically. So, yeah, we're looking at that situation. Yeah, we can talk about where it is on the field or, or everything like that. Oh, it's in the middle of the park. Oh, does it really matter? Yes, it does for the main reason possession and good possession is key to sevens if you get a good piece of possession from a scrum you've got a great attacking weapon you look at just that that as an opportunity well the nine picks up and goes right well you've got a three on two in 15s we we look often at where teams are on the on the field and now fiji are well within their 22 but we look at that from a sevens perspective that's a good attacking position. We should reward that rather than allowing them to play bad ball because of New Zealand. Yeah, um, I think I, I got, well, I learned a massive lesson. It was about two years ago uh, watching Richard Kelly. So Fiji were the defending team. I can't remember who they were playing. But whoever they played kicked the ball dead from five metres short of their line. So, of course, you're like, well, 22. Well, no, Fiji, why would Fiji want a 22? They've got an option of a scrum. Have a scrum five minutes from their line. Fiji decides to go for the scrum. Surprisingly, won the ball 90 metres later, they score in the corner. But you're looking at, you know, what teams want to do and you want to give them the opportunity to do what they want to do, not necessarily what you want them to do. Six. Big day by... Ball goes in, ball comes out. Is a referee looking at what the South African... The South African hooker knows that ball is won by Fiji. So do you allow that to carry on or do you penalise it and let it go? Um, you know, it, it's one of those things, but it's something to be aware of. Clearly, the World Rugby referees weren't aware. That's why we, we, we're seeing it here. Yeah, uh, just on Chris, that last one of the hooker leaving the scrum, obviously yeah. that's um, referee very blindsided in that situation. Is that something you're expecting an AR to put in? Is that something as a referee you want an AR to put into you? Because obviously it's, it's not a massive call, but it could have an effect on the game. As a referee, is that something that you want in your ears? Ideally, you should pick up on it yourself. I won't lie. Um, you know, it, it happens more often than you think, but especially with understanding the defensive way. So... For, for us, especially when uh, Tom and I played, Hooker went out and left. So Hooker goes left, which means the scrum half can't go down that side. So you've taken an option away from the attacking team. So technically, yes, I want to give a penalty straight away or give them the chance to or play the advantage. If I haven't done anything about it, before the next scrum sets up, I would want the AR to go. Last scrum, 
it fell apart and the hooker was out. So yeah, I think, I think the key on. is th this competition again in sevens, that's denying the competition to the, the ball-winning side, isn't it? Yeah, like, you're reducing their options. But if I haven't picked up on it, yes, you could put it in. But more than likely, I'd rather you put it in before the next scrum. So I go, last scrum, you broke early, you need to stay in. And that then brings my attention to it and then I can referee it. Because if that had been on the other side of the scrum, so let's say it's the other side of the field and I'm standing where the referee was, you might see it, but you're trying to put a call in for 40 metres or 30 metres, which same as almost with 15s, is hard to put in and yeah. be credible. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. So if the, if the AR is in a credible position, let's say it's within 20 metres of the, uh, the touchline and you're on the opposite side, you're on the open side the, and you're looking at the back feet because that's where, you know, in that particular um, situation, Fiji got the ball at the back feet. You're having to look that way and you see the, you know, as an AR, you see the uh, South African hooker literally give out to the scrum. It, it's three against two at that point. Would you want the, um, the AR then to call green, green, green and, and then feed that in to hooker has come out of the scrum? Or would you want the AR to just breathe a little and wait and see what happened next? I think you've got to give the referee the call. If, you, if you're going to give the referee call late or early, you need to give it to him early for the main reason he can go, I'm happy, I can play on. Or, OK, that's a good, good point. Play the advantage and see what happens from this one first phase because I've got a penalty to come back to. I'm only going to give them three or four, you know, three or four passes and the advantage will be over. So I want to give Fiji a chance to break. But if they don't, I'm coming straight back almost immediately to go, well, we've got penalty here. You can now kick to the corner, have another scrum. You can make your decision. I don't have to choose how you play. And one of the things I found in sevens is it's not always obvious that the referee is playing advantage based on your call. Um, sometimes they, they say nothing. I know you do, Rich. <laughs> I know you'll go, thanks, mate. Um, and I know you're going to either signal advantage or you're just going to internalise it. But not everybody does. So from, a, from an AR point of view, I think it's, it's very important to note, once you've put that call in, even if you get no acknowledgement, don't do it again. No, no, absolutely. If, if, I'm, if I need to say anything and I haven't heard your call, then I'll ask you. Other than that, if you put the call in and you're 100% correct, we watch from review and I was completely wrong, I should have taken your call, that's for me to wear. I've got to deal with that. Whereas if you continue putting it in, all you're doing is everyone's going, why, the he why are you continually putting the call in? He's heard you. He's ignoring you, but probably for a good reason. Let's, let's look at something that uh, is particular in, uh, in sevens rather than fifteens, which is this time wasting. Um, sevens is a game played, a fast-paced game played in a very, very short amount of time. And the aspect of that means that you want everything to be quickly, quicker done. It used to be, you know, take a minute, minute and a half to have a line out or a scrum or kick for a penalty for the corner. With that in mind, you want the ball in play as long as you can because you want the entertainment, you want the big scores. So just, just have a look at the USA here. There's a few things to look at. Apart from his hair. Go to the set piece. This man's so Three. important and he has been just open up the mucks well, oh, yeah. as good a yep. form as we've ever seen from him. I know it says delayed line out formation at the bottom of the screen. And it's something to look out for when we watch this again. And when we do watch this again, I want you to look at just how effective what the USA are doing. Just have a look at this, right? Look at the clock now. Six minutes and two seconds when he kicks the ball. Goes into touch at five minutes, 59 seconds. Touch is defined when the flag is up. Can you remember what time we actually uh, got the ball into touch? So... We're 15 seconds already. Then they want to point out this, that, and the other. That's nearly half a minute 
So we really don't want that to be going on. But that brings us on to the line-out and a number of line-out fences as well. Um, now, this says uh, non-line-out participants must main, uh, maintain at least 10 metres from the line. There's a number of things that are going on here. That's a Raiwa, the new stub. Mulia, the captain. So hopefully you would have seen the, the number 12 doing whatever he was doing and deciding to play for New Zealand um, and making sure that nobody could come. But look at the guy in the circle, all right, behind the referee's back, not picked up by the ARs on this occasion. Where do you stand on this in terms of your ARs giving you input there? I think this is something that came in towards the end of, well, not last year, the year before, so it's, it's been a while. Um, and looking at it, you want the AR to give you calls nice and early for the main reason that they're coming up and if you haven't seen it. But as ever, and the same as we almost have now in 15s, is the referee's in control and he should be noticing these things. So That's completely behind the, the referee's back. He may well be focusing on the guy who's jumped across the line. Did he or did he not have effect, an effect, which, of course, he didn't in that case. What would you want the the assistant referee on the far side to say as a call? Same same as he would do in 15s. Yeah, whites have come up early. White offside from the line out. Okay, lovely. Now, as a referee then, you receive that call. In 15s, you might look to play an advantage. Would you do that in sevens? Not in that position because mm. no matter what, they're going to be not behind the gain line. So <laughs> blow the whistle, give them their 10 metres and let them choose. They can kick it for touch, they can get tap and go, but the ball's in their hands and it puts England on the back foot. Uh, one of the things we, we often see, and this is a very, very um, unique thing for sevens, is people in front of the kick. I've seen people, even in sevens, top guys trying to mitigate this. And I think, Rich, you'll agree, you cannot mitigate this in sevens. No, you, you look at what, what the kickoff is. The kickoff is the biggest... Um, uh, competition and if you can regain your kickoff 60-70% of the time that increases your possession which of course causes you to get more tries. Um, with that in mind is if you're in front of the kicker it gives you an advantage. Yeah and it's one of those things that you you really cannot ever mitigate this and try and play advantage in sevens can you? No. no. Uh, kickoff is one of them things I think as a as a sevens you practice it it's actually one of the things you go, you go around and you, you, in training it's such a big part of the game because you want that ball back every time. In 15s, it's it's just a restart. In kick in in um, sevens, it's actually a form of attack. Sometimes people have play or teams have different plays, different types of kick they're going to use to get that ball back. So you send someone up, you send a, a runner out there to tap it back to two people behind him to scoop it up. So yeah, it's a, it's a massive part. It's a massive part of the game in sevens kick off. I mean, 15s, you know, more and more teams are doing it. Um, they basically, you're looking at some of the boys who have come across from the sevens mm. have, uh, have been the great, great examples of doing it for their teams, like Bath. I think Saris have tried it once or twice. Foul play is foul play, whether it be uh, 15s or, or 17s. There are a couple of slight differences. And I think, Rich, you'll agree with me that this is where we, we've got to be quick on the whistle and potentially we've got to be quicker in the cards as well. Absolutely. And this is, this is one of the things with sevens is, you know, any high tackle pretty much is a yellow card. And mm -hmm. with that in mind means that the only time you're not going to stop play is if they're literally going straight in. Other than that, there you go. just over the shoulder, that's penalty only. Anything more that would be a yellow card, which I think you'll see on the next one. Yeah, it's that sort of seat belt tackle that we see in, in 15s quite often, isn't it? It starts low, it rides up. But again, the penalty in, in sevens is the advantage, isn't it? Yeah, especially here. You look at, he's been tackled. He's got no, no, uh, he's not offloaded the ball. Therefore, let's give him the penalty and they can choose what they want to do. Yeah, and, and look, there Australia didn't take choose to take the, uh, the quick one. But if they did... Japan are always um, on the back foot. They're, they're always just settling backwards, waiting, aren't they, after the whistle? Rich, I'll just chuck a question in quickly. Um, obviously, in the 15s game, the Six Nations and stuff, we've seen a lot of red cards. We've seen a lot of yellow cards. Do you think, as we go into the seventh season, we're going to have a, a lot more cards being shown? Do you think there'll be a lot more red cards? Or do you no. think it's going to be... No, for the main reason that sevens, we've, this is how we've been refereeing it for the last four years. Yeah. So over the shoulder, just on the shoulder is a penalty. Anything more than that's a yellow and direct head, head contact, which 
be fair, we haven't had too many of. We've had a couple, uh, one on the floor, I remember, and one head on head, which I wanted mm. to look at because of my interpretation through the RFU compared to other uh, unions' interpretation. But actually, when we're all together, yeah, fine, play on, or that's a red card. I um, honestly think in sevens, there's less of this Owen Farrell high rem the ball tackle. What they want to do is get them to the floor, roll it their way quickly, and let their mate come in and grab the ball in sevens. That much. Yeah. You've got certain teams that will do play that way. So Samoa will hit you hard because that's the way they play. Um, South Africa, you, I think, will, would as well. To be fair, quite a few of the teams will hit you hard and look to basically not necessarily um, get on the ball. They're trying to hit you as hard as they can on the ball. Around yeah. where you're carrying the ball, the main reason, yes, you're taking it to ground, but I want to win the contact. I knock you yeah. back, people overrun, therefore I'm on the front foot rather than you. So clear high, high tackle there. Uh, and yellow card. If you have a look, there you go. It's always above the, the line of the shoulders. It's always going to be a, a high tackle. And it's always going to be a yellow card. And of course, in sevens, the uh, the advantage is, as Richard said before, that power play seven on six. Oh, that's another big one shot. That was right up around the jaw. Whereas this one, <laughs> it's probably... A, a little bit more serious. I think, Rich, you'll agree there's a fair degree of force there. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy I'm not on the other side of that. Uh, and if you can see what I can see with Tom's face, he's going, ooh! <laughs> but want to be on the receiving end of that, Tom? No, that is a, that's a decent one. That, oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think you know, and the referees in the great place. I don't, I don't think there's. A... I think I think everyone in the stadium's in a great place for that one. I mean, <laughs> no, no one's missing that. But you're right. It, it, there was never any attempt to tackle uh, the, the, the tackler. We, we've talked about this in fifteens. We've seen it. The tackler is always high. Now, I'm actually a bit surprised by this, that it was only a yellow. I think you, because, you're looking at a hair pull being a yellow card at present. Um, hasn't, hasn't exceeded that, I don't think, as of yet. But Do you not agree, Rich, that if you deliberately <laughs> grab somebody's hair from behind because you can't tackle them properly, I might as well just grab somebody by the chin or the forehead and yank them back? Yeah, but I remember the days when you could grab them by the back of the collar. <laughs> and the collar for where she's grabbing isn't too far away from her hair. Yeah, yeah OK. We, we couldn't grab you by the collar because your headband pushed your hair too far back. That's had nothing to do with me. That was all on you then. I can't remember what year that was. It's got to be a minimum of yellow every time, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. It's gone past the point of just being a penalty. It's, it's a yellow card because of what you've done. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to work out if I'd ever give a red and I don't think... I can, can't I no, think of a situation where I would. I mean, if you look at that, there is, <laughs> there's no <laughs> mitigation there whatsoever, is there? Not really, no. So we, we, we're still looking on the uh, on foul play. We're looking at things that, oh, um, that are going to go on without the ball. Uh, here we go. Here. And there have you just heard the, uh, the extra blast of the whistle. The yellow card. The yellow card. Yeah. I don't know whether you saw it. Shoulder. <laughs> but you did then. The no difference to what we're seeing in the 15s, especially at the moment. Um, and I think, again, Rich, you'll be testament to this, that um, what we've seen a couple of years ago here in the sevens has transferred to the 15 side game. Absolutely. Um, I, I think it's pretty, pretty clear and obvious. Um, um, Mike? Just yeah. a quick one, going back to the hair pull, I've got a quick question from Steve Whiteside. There's a high degree of danger with the hair pull. Um, at our level, it could cause serious injury, i.e. whiplash or, or something to that extent. D do we then go up, start thinking about a red card for a hair pull? For me, that, that's going to have to be in your judgment for the main reason that from where I'm referring, I've never seen anything that would be 
that that way. But saying that is, you know, at the community game, giving a red card for a hair pull, especially when the player's completely pulled to the floor or dragged back, then yeah, it would make sense. Mm. Or Ed would have no problem with that. It'd just be a question of the referee selling the decision of, it, of having to escalate it to that, that extent. I think it's a judgment call, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, for World Series, it's definitely black and white. This is where we start. This is where we finish. Whereas I think with a community game, you're taking in, in all the other aspects of safety and uh, who you're refereeing for and what you're trying to get out of the game and what they're trying to get out of the game. You don't want someone, as you say, whiplash on Monday morning, not be able to go to work when COVID's finished. Then, you know, that being <laughs> the whole thing. Whereas <laughs> for us, it's if, if there's an incident like that, we can have at least have more of a chance to look at it and make a bigger decision generally about it and of course we've got sighting as well again we, you know lifting people off the ground it's no different in the um, in the sevens game as it is in the 15s game rich no no not at all so you can see he's lifted him no you carry on past the horizontal and he's landed on his back so that's a yellow card you know that's no different to that one i put in for you in dubai no, even though i'm surprised you haven't just pull that one up now and just you know substituted it in. There was no, there was no decent camera angles, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Uh, apart from it, it lasted about forty-five seconds because, of course, they went on to score the try. We had a great conversation uh, during the uh, during the the, the, the try scoring moment, and mm -hmm. you still went and gave him a yellow card, which I thought was brilliant. Oh, yeah. that... Great refereeing, as far as I'm concerned, mate. The referee has blown up. Oh yeah, looks like. Kelter is in big trouble here. So you've lifted her, you've passed the horizontal, and she's landed in a very dangerous position, so it's going to be a red card. That's the correct decision, in my opinion. <laughs> There's a few astonished faces there, Rich. Yeah, and I remember we, we've spoken about this one on the series as well, because I think Amy was looking to give a yellow when before she could see how she landed properly. Into the yeah, no, that's that's one of those 50 50. So she has technically landed on her back, but while she landed on her back, that is so so borderline, so severe, isn't it? If she hadn't all almost been turned by the tackler, she would have she, she you know, she could have broken her neck there. Easily. It's, I think it's the whole, it's almost fallen in the same category as um, the tackle player breaking his fall with his hands, but he would have landed on his head. Correct. Yeah, and so, it's just that that last second turn that stops her landing on the head, isn't it? Exactly, and and in that, especially in that case, you're looking at going. It is a very dangerous tackle. It's past the you've taken her past the horizontal, and she's landed very dangerously. Yeah, you'd and never think, do that, would you, Tom? No, I didn't make any tackles. I was no <laughs> worries. No worries, Actually, yeah. no, you're right. I've, I've checked your showreel and I can't yeah, find not a single, any tackles not a anywhere. tackle made in 19 years. It's pretty... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, ju ju just on the flip side of it, has anybody ever tackled you and done that to you? Um... Yeah, actually, there was one time against uh, Toulouse and um, the cup final for Wasps and Fritz, the centre, dumped, dumped me on my head and he got, he got red-carded. I actually had one tackle I did do one tackle against Bath. It was my only ever dump tackle. I got a yellow card. I never tackled again. That was it. Got <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. I, I, I hate to say this, but ju just so the referees can understand this, mate, um, go, let's go back to, to that one in Toulouse uh, where you got turned upside down and put down. How did that affect A, your game, if you stayed on the pitch, B, your day, and, and then C, if you didn't stay on the pitch, the next few weeks? In all honesty, it had zero effect because <laughs> I was just entertained that the, the bloke who got sent off was so raging. He was so angry. And obviously, he was a red card and we went on to win the game. It was at Adams Park, actually, Dale. You were playing yeah. on, yeah. on the other, other wing. And I was over the moon because we... From that point, we went on and won the game. Look, I, I think when you're in that position and you have no control as the person being tackled, and you're like, like it's down to the it's down to the tackle how I'm going to land here. And obviously, well, the way I, I did land on my head, and I wasn't the happiest about it. And it is that sense of being completely out of control. And I don't think at any point in the in whether you're a tackle or defender, you should be out of control. You should be able to be able to be in control. And when you're in that position. That's when it is dangerous because there is a lack of control. Even the boat lifting you doesn't know where you're going. 
and that's, that's the, the, the force of the impact. You know, you, you could go anywhere, and you you what have seen her ended tackles. Were you ever on the receiving end of one of those? Yeah, I would say more than once. He was yeah. like a twig, though. You're like a yeah, javelin, weren't you? Get rid of, you, you? You would get rid of the ball before any big men came near you. Well, you say that, but there's been a few instances where I forgot to get rid of the ball. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What was your name, Tom Voice? Uh, uh, no, no, I uh, like passing way too much. Um, but no, no, I think that, that for me, the whole insects, I've, you know, I've been dumped out, I've been landed on my head, I've landed on my back, you know, bits and pieces. And the issue comes with what the knock-on effect is. Either you're looking at head knocks, or you're looking at concussion and, and, and the knock-on effects, yeah. which we're now seeing more prevalently in retired rugby players. But also, it's a safety issue. So the, the aspect of the referee is to be there to basically judge safety, make sure that everyone is safe. And with that in mind, you're looking at um, sanctioning things like that to try and get out of the game. No, I agree with you. And I think the slow mo shows it. Uh, it shows it even better because you take that hand away, and you take that twist away, and she's she's in real danger. This young man. So this is probably one of the hardest things for referees in sevens or fifteens, probably more fifteens, to spot than anything else. And I don't know whether you saw it in live play there. Um, have a look now. You've got to just stand a little bit away and watch. And there you go. Look where the referee is. The referee is completely over the other side. And fair play to him. He saw that. You're going to see some of these things more easily in sevens than you are in fifteens because there's less players on the pitch. You're looking at foul play, and you know that's what you want the ARs to be helping you with. With in this, this in mind. It's usually where the um, players got in before the clearing defender, so, you know, the, the attacker, sorry. Um, and so he's in a good position. And the only way to get rid of him is to actually, you know, yank on his neck. This is the throwing the ball away, which we, we see often in 15 potentially. But in sevens, like you said, time and everything else is key. So um, the, the Welsh player picks up the ball, walks away and then just drops it uh, behind him. Now, in sevens, I can't reiterate enough how that has got to be a yellow card. Uh, here's another example. I I'm sure you'd agree here, Rich, that <laughs> it is always a yellow card regardless. Yeah, and this in is fact, you can't tolerance. disagree because you're yellow carding him at this point. He's a nice guy as well. Um, no, it's, it's a zero <laughs> tolerance. It it's that whole thing of zero tolerance and everyone knows it. Um, you hear the commentators almost say it as soon as he does it. You know, I don't need to really even give them the card. They all know, don't they? Yeah. They all know. And the players all know as well. And that's that the other is, thing. This is going to happen. And this is what gets me. Why on earth would you do it when you know this is going to happen? But that as a player, I think as a player, you um that is the most frustrating thing in a sevens game. You got a quick tap, you're trying to get the ball off someone, and he's bloody walking away of it, he throws it he, another ten meters. It is lit honestly. Well, that's, that's the only thing that winds me up <laughs> in the sevens game of the pitch <laughs> when a player does that. It breaks me every time. Just it, give me the ball back. Give me yeah, the ball. But it, but that's exactly the reason why they're doing it. They're trying mm. to slow you down so their defence can get organised. Therefore, you're less likely yeah. to score. So by giving putting that player in the bin, it gives you more an advantage, actually. Yeah, so do you reckon that the, the defence is happy to take that two minutes? Just to slow that one one little potential play down? No, it's it's a whole no. thing of just a player. Is it off just hot headedness? It's just hot headedness because even because if if, if if a player does that on my team, where he walks away with the ball, you're fuming at him because the, the last thing you want is to be down to six men. It, yeah. it's the it's the worst thing because you just know you're going to be blowing out of your ass. Rich has just put it perfectly. These are in sevens zero tolerance mm. lines, and that's one of them. You throw the ball away, you're going. End of. There's no discussion. There's no... And, and it's a bit like that in front of the kick at the uh, at the restart. It's a zero tolerance. It's a free kick. There's no, let's see if you run on side. There's no, let's see if you actually are material. It's a free kick. Mm. And this is what we've got to do as, as referees moving from 15s to 7s, is to take that mantra on board. Yeah. Now, one of the things that came out is um, is the preventing a player 
from leaving a rook or a breakdown. Um, Rich, do you want to just tell us what this is about before we see it? Yeah, so when you're thinking about um, getting a defensive line and you decide that the ruck you're trying to win is lost and you're not going to get the ball away, then I should have the opportunity to leave the ruck and join the defensive line. And what was happening before was one of the players in the ruck wasn't letting you let go or pulling you back at the last minute, which meant that the tackle that you should have made or were able to affect, um, you were missing and therefore there was a break uh, for the attack. So it was brought... And it's an immediate penalty. No, no discussion. Again, it's one of those red lines, isn't it? Absolutely. It's not even that you've gone down that, gone down that hole. It's the whole thing of, I've been pulled out of the defensive line. We are a player down. Um, and therefore, it's a zero tolerance as well. Yeah. So if you have a look at this, you'll see exactly where, where Rich is coming from on this one. <laughs> now, I don't know whether you spotted it, but the referee did. Must leave him alone. Trying to get out of the breakdown. There's Godsmark oh. again. Yeah, done now. Referee's pretty hot on this. Freak. Another penalty added to the cumulative total million. And this was this came in at the beginning of the last season's um, series, didn't it, Rich? Yes, it did. Yeah. He's looking to leave that breakdown. So, Mark keeps hold of his. If leg. you have a look here, That's the rug, and some of the referees are going to be penalising this weekend. It's almost like a, a tackle uh, from a player on the floor, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, and it's. Taking the player out the, out of the play, so you know the defence are down a man. Yeah, and it, it's just something that can't happen. Um, and so uh, on those red lines, this is one of those things that World Rugby has said. Certainly in the sevens game, and let's face it, we'll probably see this in a four years' time in the fifteens game. It's not going to be acceptable anymore. Mm. Um, and so, guys, if you're doing sevens this season, this summer. This is one of those things that you've really, really got to keep an eye on. That's the end of all of those things. And there was a lot of information in there. Uh, Chris, what, um, what comments or questions have you had uh, over the course of that? Um, the main one that I've got is, is that one that I touched on earlier from Harry uh, regarding the sort of mental preparation process between 7 okay. and 15. So, um, so let, let's let's have a, a, a chat to Rich on that. So for me, it's, there's a massive switch between 15s and 7s. And I, you know, leading up to the tournament, especially whilst being away, it's easy for me to do that. But it comes down to basically getting my head on those fo focus points. So I know I'll watch that video maybe once or twice during the week, but also we'll go through bits and pieces of it whilst we're away. But for me, the focus literally comes probably Thursday before the Saturday tournament. We'll be going through, I'll have my own little bank of clips of me refereeing sevens or someone else refereeing sevens and just looking at those and making sure that my head is in the game of what I'm seeing and what I want to penalise and where I want to be getting around the park, the running, running lines that I want to be doing. So it's almost going into the tournament having watched a lot of sevens or certain clips of sevens to get my head focused on those aspects that I need to referee that is different from 15s. So you you watch that. I mean, I mean, I know we've expanded that video tonight quite quite a lot, and there's a lot of discussion around that. But that video probably lasts about twenty minutes, doesn't it? So you watch that a couple of times a week coming into a tournament. Yeah. So you know, we've got the AR briefing, so we brief the ARs from wherever we're we're, we're going, um, and that will be one of the things we go through. Let's take going into the next tournament, seventh tournament. I do. I'll definitely have watched that once or twice during the week for the main reason I'm going well I haven't refereed sevens in 18 months it'll be probably by the time I get my chance and looking at that is going to make sure that what I'm refereeing on the day is the things that I've always meant to referee not creating something else from 15s or you know allowing my my standards to drop to 15s right my standards have to be at sevens I see someone throw the ball away it should almost be reactionary that I'm already now I'm blowing Moist will get me a yellow card out yeah um, a high tackle I already know where I'm going with this. I see, you know, whatever trigger I need and it's almost right. I know exactly what's happening here. The decision's been made and I don't have to think about it. So it's making sure that I'm in that mode rather than it being every time there's a decision, I'm going, oh, um, am I refereeing 15s? Am I refereeing sevens? Oh, what do I need to do here? No, I know my mentally that I'm ready to do what I need to do. For the so game. I suppose 
um, from, from a community rugby aspect when moving from 15s at the end of the season to getting into sevens. It would do them, uh, you know, us referees well to start watching things on YouTube from the World Series or, or other, you know, European or world, world, world stage uh, games just to see how, what the difference is um, with, uh, with, with the way we refer- have refereed for potentially nine months to how we're now going to referee for the next three months. Absolutely. And I think this is the whole thing of you look at when you referee 15s, when you watch rugby, what do you watch? 15s, because that's literally all that's on TV. Whereas when you're going into the Selma series and you're looking at sevens, it's a game that you don't see often but you need to be performing at your best. You don't want to be the referee who's refereeing sevens like 15s and everyone's questioning every single decision and, you know, you're not having rapport with the players because they don't know what you're going to referee. Whereas if everyone's on the same page and everyone's refereeing sevens the way you want sevens to be played and you want, you know, the, the, uh, the red lines in the sand, then everyone knows what they're getting. And it's, it's you know, everyone else, uh, everyone's, can be happier because they're getting it across the board. That's good. Now, um, Chris, uh, a- a- anything else coming in the, um, um, recently? Got two more. Uh, one, I just want to bounce that same question to Tom in terms of what's a player's mental prep in uh, difference in 15 to 7. Lungs. For me, it's the, it's the recovery. Obviously, in a tournament, you're playing you know, three, sometimes four, four games in a day. And it's about that coming down from a game. You're in 15, you're up for the game, you're in it for 80 minutes, and then you're, you're off for a, you're, you're off to a Monday's training session or, or the following weekend's game. But with sevens, it's literally you're up and down all day long. So getting that recovery in, calming yourself down, taking your way out, you know, taking yourself away from, I suppose, that, that sort of match day environment is the most important thing. Um, in terms of your approach to it, there's no difference. You just get as anxious or as nervous or excited about the game as you would in a 15s game. But it's getting, knowing that when to switch off from it and then when to get yourself back into it again, getting ready for the next game. I mean, and when me and Richard used to do the England stuff, we used to take, when we went to Hong Kong, we used to take ourselves completely back to the hotel, away from the stadium, so you can completely switch off from it all. And then you're hyping yourself up again for the next game. So like every game was like your first game of the day. Guys, um, I just want to ask now, um, Richard, from a refereeing point of view, one tip that guys who are watching tonight can take away ready for this season? I think just being prepared. So being prepared, knowing what you want to referee and knowing your red lines. It's simple, that simple. If you can do those two things, have an idea of how you want to referee and where you need to be, but also making sure that you tick those, tick those boxes on making sure that high tackles, ball thrown away, anything like that, then you're pretty much halfway there. Lovely. Tom, from your point of view? I think we've touched on it already tonight. It's the, it's the small details that go that you get away with in the 15s game, but you can't the sevens. You know, the kickoff, the breakdown, rolling away from the tackle. These, te- these tiny parts of the game, which make such a huge difference to the sevens game, if the referees can get those bits right, the whole game will flow a lot better. It's much quicker, isn't it? Decisions for players... And referees have got to be much quicker. No, absolutely, you've you've got the you've got to uh, as long as the, it's a fair contest, as in both teams are legal, you've got to let that that contest breathe. And you, that's where you give it that chance to see what happens. Whereas player off the foot, off their feet, not rolling away, high tackles, throwing the ball, very quick decisions, and you know it's straight on your whistle and let's get on playing. Well, guys, look, I, uh, we've we've kept you far longer than we we said we would, so thank you very very much. Thank you.